my computer says that it's four o'clock. So let me call the July 6th meeting of the conference select board to order. The first item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, minutes to approve May 21st and 28th, 2020, June 2nd, uh, open session, June 2nd, executive session not to be released, June 10th and June 12th, open sessions, June 12th, executive session not to be released, June 16th, 2020, open session, June 16th, 2020, executive session not to be released. Gift acceptances from William and Maureen Kameza of $510 for the Memorial Tree account and his Presence Christian Fellowship Incorporated, a $1,000 gift to the Council on Aging Gift Account. We're grateful for both of those and also a donation from David and Melissa Schonenfeld of a 2003 Volkswagen Jetta valued at $3,267 to the fire department to be used for training, and we are grateful for that gift as well. And I would entertain a motion. So move. Second. Uh, I think you need to say, Linda, move to approve the consent calendar. Move to approve the consent calendar. And is there second. a second? All right, would the clerk please call the roll? Okay, Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? I myself, Ms. Escobedo, I. I know that passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda is the town manager update. Mr. Town Manager. Hi, good evening, everyone. Hope everybody had a nice long weekend. Um, and I will tell you that the um, compressed work week and the and the holiday uh, made it so I have a much shorter report, um, which is in, in many ways a positive thing. I think it, people got a chance to catch a breath. It seems uh, among the. Um, the, the town team here, the SMTs and SMT members. So uh, a couple of things that I, I had mentioned before that the NMI Starment committee has a survey that they are looking for community feedback on. Um, they'd like to finish that up around Wednesday. So we'd encourage people to go to the, if you go to the town's website, the NMI Starment committee has its own page and you can access the electronic survey there. So if, uh, people are, are uh, interested in offering their, seeing the plan and offering their thoughts, please check that out. We want to get a, as much community feedback as possible, which I think, as we all know, is, is a challenge um, in, in during the pandemic. Um, I, last time we had talked about, I think we talked last time about um, economic vitality and, and signage and things like that. And uh, we are working on that. Uh, there's a lot of kind of behind the scenes conversations happening about what can we do about signage, um, you know, outdoor entertainment, things like that. I don't have anything to report concrete yet other than there's a lot of um a lot of things um working uh, i think trying to get everything working in the same direction so hopefully uh next week we'll have more to report uh, on that but everyone is really working hard to try and find ways to um, support and promote businesses um, um you know in all of the business districts so speaking of business uh bd center is um ready to reopen uh right now it's obviously under some restrictions that a bit that are a part of the phase three reopening plan from the governor um the biggest thing is it's it's really by appointment only and so if you are a bd member or want to become a member of the bd center it's it's essential that you go to the bd center website and look at what the restrictions are and and how to make an appointment to use the equipment um <laughs> The guidance by the state is, like I said, it's pretty rigorous with the cleanings that you have to do and the spacing you have to allow for in the gym. But I mean, the people who work at and operate BD really want to get back to work and, and give um, its members the opportunity to kind of exercise and you know have the benefit of using the pool and stuff like that. So um, we're going to try it. It's 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 a challenge, but we're going to try it and see if we can make it work for the membership in the community. And the last thing I had was I, last week I had sent out a, uh, a message using the code red system about supporting local business. It's something that I had done, um, not necessarily at the direct request of the business community, but something that we had discussed as a way that the town could support them. And uh, I did get, I, I guess there was some feedback about, you know, using it for those means. Uh, and I guess the way I looked at it is, um, 
you know, the primary purpose of the code red system is for emergency notifications. And, and like I'm enrolled in the Concord system. So I did get a phone call last night with the automated message about the severe thunderstorm warning. And that's the primary purpose. But it also is, as a secondary purpose, a community notification system. And during this pandemic, um, we have used it, um, I don't know, maybe five times in that, you know, to provide updates for the impacts uh, of COVID-19 uh, on municipal operations. All the, script, the scripts of all those calls are, were sent out by news and notices. And I think if you go back and look through them, they were, I, I believe they were really consistent about here's what's happening. Here's an update on, on what's going on and how, um, how things have changed as a result of the pandemic. And I guess I viewed the message about the really kind of economic emergency that many businesses in Concord find themselves in as a natural progression of that messaging about the impact of COVID-19. Um, nevertheless, um, even though I, even like I said, even though I viewed it as a consistent use of the system, which I had previously gotten you know, really positive feedback, uh, I will definitely, I, I've heard the, the feedback I got about that message and will definitely be more selective um, going forward and making sure that the focus of the messaging is on uh, municipal operations and, and work with the business community on maybe other ways to get those messages out. So I just wanted to tell the board that I, I and the community that I've heard you and um, I will, I'll rethink that approach. So I, that's about it for me if anybody has any questions. Good. So is there any questions of the town manager? Um, I guess to the, the point that you just made, Stephen, I think it would be great to, maybe for us to come up with a place where um, your voice could be heard or, or um, you know, almost a town manager speaks kind of space that wasn't just in your report to the select board, you know, every Monday or if we go back to every other Monday, but some other platform where you could make those kind of um, uh, public statements um, as they may arise. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I, I well, the, you know, the, the, the thing about Code Red is, is it, it's it, its effectiveness at reaching the, the, uh, a broad yeah. swath of the community and um, setting up Radio Free Steve. For, you know, I'd be concerned that not enough people would really tune in. And, and I mean, Jane, you know, there's a board, you, you all know this. I mean, hardly a week goes by where we don't get the feedback that people didn't know what we were doing or didn't receive a notification or something like that. And, you know, news and notices, news and notices is really the primary communication tool we use. Um, Cause even when we do social media posts, it's still distributed by um, through news and notices. And, you know, people say, well, just send, can't the town send out an email. Well, yeah, if you take five minutes and go and sign up for news and notices, you'll get an email to a link that'll tell you what you need to know. And so I, I want to, I don't want to, rather than diversify our, our outreach streams, I'm trying to consolidate them and just market the ones we have. So uh, I think it really is um, a getting people to, you know, every, t and at every meeting I, I mentioned news and notices, but also, like I said, um, I really, I really do genuinely believe that the business community um, is really in a, a difficult place right now. I think that that's very clear from the feedback we've gotten. Um, from both Concord together and the Economic Vitality Committee. And I also think it's possible uh, there are residents who just aren't aware of the difficulty of that, that those businesses face. And if they were, they'd be like, well, if I knew that they were in trouble, I'd have gone out and gotten takeout or gone shopping or something like that. And so that's really, that's really the, 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 the thought behind that message. But again, I, I do, you know, not every place, not every community uses it the same way. And um, if that was one too far in terms of a non-traditional type message, fine. I mean, I think messages like town meeting has been moved to this date and, you know, these types of things will be the way we will continue to use it for municipal operations. So, um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to communicate better. Um, and I think we spent a lot of time realizing that we're still not reaching a vast majority of people. And that's why Code Red is so good at doing that. Linda, you're muted. Um, the other thing I would comment on is that it it's good to be responsive to this feedback and evaluate it going forward. Um, but I, I always think we need to step back sometimes and um, evaluate, you know, was this one person, two people, or was it 
you know, an overwhelming response. Um, but you've made a good point in terms of your reasons for looking at this going forward. Are there any other? Yeah, I, I mean, for what it's worth, the, the business community people that I heard from were deeply appreciative of it, and that made, and that made me feel good. But I do, I do acknowledge that it is an atypical type of message. Any additional uh, questions for the town manager? Next item on the agenda is chair's remarks. I have a few things to report. Um, as a follow on to last uh, week's meeting uh, with respect to how we were gonna deal with certain articles, I, uh, on our behalf, we reached out to the school committee to ask for their input on the middle school stabilization fund. And they took that up at their meeting last week and were very encouraging of us moving ahead with that stabilization uh, fund article. So I know I was the uh, only one who was hesitant about that. So I will uh, put that on the uh, agenda for a meeting I'll speak about in a minute. And the second one was the fossil fuel uh, article, Article 40. I was asked whether there was, had been an amendment and uh, had there been a ruling on Brookline, there is an amendment or a newer version that's applicable only to new construction. And the a attorney general has not ruled as yet on um, uh, the Brookline matter. Um, so I also want to report a reminder that I'm having a community event meeting with uh, folks, civil organizations in town. That's on Wednesday to talk about one of the recommendations from the Economic Vitality Committee. And on Tuesday, we're having this uh, an annual town meeting warrant preliminary review meeting with Linda and myself and Dean Banfield and Mary Hartman and uh, uh, the town moderator uh, to see if we can move some of these articles ahead. Uh, and then we'll follow up uh, after that with the full meeting of the select board and um, the finance committee. I want to say though, because I've heard from a couple of folks that uh, in, uh, in the decisions that we're going to have to make about annual town meeting warrant articles, uh, we had talked about uh, a motion that would postpone indefinitely or to the next special town meeting, those articles that we didn't view as essential. And I just want to say that it's not viewing an article as not essential is in no way indicative of being opposed to a particular article. Only thing we're doing is trying to be very mindful of uh, public health issues around this coronavirus and only trying to deal with those articles in town meeting that we really must deal with. So if the select board and the finance committee recommends an article uh, beyond the motion to postpone it, I hope folks will understand that has nothing to do with whether or not the select board and or the finance committee actually supports a particular article. So I wanted to say that. We have completed a, a draft of, of the library agreement between trustees of the library and the town manager and myself. And that uh, uh, public hearing where that is gonna be at our select board meeting on July 13th. Uh, so I'm pleased. I want to thank uh, folks from the library and Stephen for all the hard work they did to get us uh, get us that far ahead. Uh, and I also wanted to say to the select board that uh, on July 20th, so a couple of meetings from now, I am going to propose that we begin the review of warrant articles for town meeting. So as you recall, we have to, we don't have to, but it's our practice is to make recommendations about various Warren articles. So uh, I'll uh, tee that up for us to begin that process um, uh, on July 20th. And then I have a statement that I would like to read. As I have previously reported, the parties to the litigation had a telephone status conference with the judge to discuss the case in mid-May. During that call, the parties discussed the defendant's closure of the southern entrance to the unpaved portion of the Estabrook Road. The judge recognized that the town might be forced to seek a preliminary injunction requiring defendants to reopen the road pending trial, but urged the parties to first try to work it out. The town has tried to work it out. We proposed a public meeting with the defendants to discuss the matter. And as you will recall, certain defendants wanted a private meeting. 
the select board then voted to have Ms. Ackerman and myself attend a meeting on behalf of the board. And we did finally meet with the defendants in mid-June to discuss, to begin discussions about reopening the road. Unfortunately, the town's conversations with most of the defendants have since concluded without resolution. Although Mr. and Mrs. Rasmussen have expressed interest in continuing the discussions. I am unable to share any details of those discussions because the defendants ask that they be kept confidential. In light of the stalemate with most of the defendants, the select board had no alternative other than to file a motion for a preliminary injunction with the land court in order to preserve the public's right of access to the southern unpaved portion of the road while the litigation is pending. The motion was filed with the court on July 3rd. We also asked the court for a status conference to explore options for a prompt and final resolution of the lawsuit. And the next item on our agenda is the discussion of Ag Day. And I see that Happy is here with us. So perhaps Happy, you could uh, get us started by reminding everybody of your name and where you live. Um, it's Happy Go Third, 606 Old Bedford Road. And Happy, could I ask you to turn your volume up a little bit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doesn't want to. <laughs> okay, how's that? That's better. Okay, 606 Old Bedford Road. And I represent the Ag committee and we are interested in the possibility of still holding Ag Day in September. It's a town, a town outdoor event and uh, basically the governor has opened all farmers markets in the state and there are protocols in place for holding a, a farmers market. And then we have farm stands in Concord that are open uh, with their own protocols as well for handling produce and people. And um, we usually have participation from the Garden Club, and I have been in touch with them, but they are not currently able to have garden tours, but would participate in the market in some way with the table or whatever. We would have, I believe, approximately nine farms represented on Main Street, and the hours would be approximately 10 to 2. And I think the only interesting detail that might be discovered a little bit is circulation but I believe that is somewhat easily worked out. I understand that uh, even though we as a committee had chosen September 12th, that that is a possible town meeting day, so it's probably not available. So the only other option for us would be September 15th, and least desirable would be September 19th. Well, first, Happy, uh, town meeting is not going to happen on September 12th. Okay. Uh, uh, it's going to happen on, uh, we hope, it's going to happen on the 13th okay. at 1 o'clock in the afternoon at uh, the Doug White Field. So um, so that's, that's that. Uh, comments or questions from the select board? Stephen, I don't know. Um, if farmers markets have been opened by the Commonwealth, does this qualify as a farmers market? I mean, I suppose it is. I mean, well, I think that um, if it's a great day and it's a great event, and certainly happy we can, you know, if we want to set up a time to talk, if we need to modify the event to conform with the guidelines of farmers markets and make sure that we're doing everything according to. Um, the state's requirements, we should be able to do that. I get, as I've mentioned before, the ability to block off the road um, and provide, you know, barriers and things like that. We could even look at expanding the area so people can spread out even more. 
Um, so these are all things we're prepared to engage the committee with and support the event any way we can. So what, Stephen, what is the path forward? Should you or your staff just be meeting with the representatives from the Ag Committee and see if you can put together a plan? Yeah, let's, then, yeah, let's, let's start there. Does it need approval of the select board? Uh, I think only if it's, um, I don't know if, if road closures require approval of the select board or the Public Works Commission, but um, that would be the only thing. Um, did, did, does the board, did the board, I wasn't here when Ag Day got planned for last year, but did the board vote to close the road or is that PWC? I think, I think it's the police department or um, yeah, that's uh, right. Works that it has to be an application filed, uh, I think, with the police uh, to close a road. I think I recall that with the court, the yeah. cheese event in December. But we usually make an application to the police department and they reserve that day to assign an officer or two. I actually think, um, not to make work, but this may be something, and Susan, if I, if you don't think this is the right approach, let me know, but this may be something where someone from the Ag Committee should go to the Economic Vitality Committee um, to talk about the event, because I just think we're in such a, a, a new time and a different time than we normally are when we plan this, that if we do talk about expanding the, the area downtown in which the event takes place, are there opportunities for other businesses um, to participate and or would expanding the area harm other businesses? So th I think this is the type of dialogue I think I'd like to try and engage people in. The actual mecha you know, the mechanics of getting together the approvals of the police and you know any kind of permitting we need will be relatively smooth. Um, I just think we it's the, it's the engaging in the dialogue with people who may have impacts from this that I think is important. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'll be specific and say, would it make sense to close Walden Street? I think in the in the uh, survey done by Concord Together, I did note that there was some support for closing Walden Street for special events. You know, could we do that as a part of Ag Day and spread tables and things out? But Susan, I that's my kind of off the top of my head. I don't know what your thoughts are. Um, I I think it's it, it is a good idea to have a dialogue. The the committee Economic Vitality Committee is meeting this Wednesday at four o'clock. Um, I can. Uh, Today's Monday. I, I will contact Jen or John, Jen and John, the co-chairs, to see if we can get that on the agenda. And happy if someone from your it'll be at 4, 4 p.m. It's a Zoom meeting. If someone from your committee could be available, then I'll loop back with you to let you know whether or not we can put it on the agenda. Okay, it'll probably be me. Okay. And uh, also, I would say uh, happy that I'm putting this group meeting uh, Wednesday together to talk about a community event. Uh, and, and I don't know whether Ag Day just gets expanded into a community event or is just a different one. But if you want to come to that meeting, I'll send you the um, I'll send you the information about it as well. I'm just okay. looking. What time is it on Wednesday? Uh, it's at ten o'clock. So Wednesday is Concord Day. <laughs> Every day is Concord Day. That's so true. All right. Uh, any other members of the board have a comment or, or some input to share on this, Linda? The only other thing I can think of, uh, because I'm not familiar with the specific protocol on this, is the Board of Health, because of COVID time, I don't know if they need to be involved. Well, I'd probably need to review it in the sense that there are guidelines for these events and, and it probably needs to be monitored, I would think, but I'll leave that to Stephen. To yeah, they will be involved. I don't know if they need to be involved at this stage because the things that they, if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's serve, if we decide to serve food in some format, it's one inspection or five inspections. It, you know, I, I think it's more once we have a plan of what the Ag Committee really sees as, you know, the right fit for the event, we would just present that in whole to the Board of Health and, and to Susan Rex. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Happy. We'll look forward to hearing back uh, as this uh, idea percolates its way through. Thank, thank you very you. much. The next item on our agenda is the ability of Alexa Anderson to participate in Concord Public School deliberations without vote authorization. She is filling a uh, 
unexpired term of a member of the school board who resigned. And at the select board meeting uh, last, excuse me, at the school committee meeting last week, the school committee voted to allow her to participate without voting. And because it's an unexpired elected term, uh, the matter has to come before the select board. So here it is. And if there's no comments or concerns about it, see Linda. Sorry. Um, the only thing, I, I, mean, I have no problem with um, her assuming her role because it's an unexpired term. I'm just curious about why she can't vote since it is an unex a vacancy that she's filling. I don't, I don't know. Stephen, do you? Yeah, I, I think it has to do with um, the, the same issue, with, which is the reason why Mike is still here, um, is because the, the term of office takes effect after town meeting. Even to Linda's question, even if there's nobody in the seat. Yeah, hmm. I and I, I, I should have prepared better. This. We did run this through, through Mina. Okay. And he did yeah. come to that conclusion after doing some research. And so that was based on um, town council's recommendation. I should have that message open, um, but that was, and I, he did cite the reasons. I just don't have them at my fingertips, but I can get them. I specifically but. raised the issue of, well, why can't we do it for Matt? Uh, but it turned out it was because it was an unexpired resignation and an expired term. I thought the answer was going to be different as well, but when he did additional research, um, and I don't know if it was the bylaws or um, some other, you know, um, data point, but it was, he came to the same conclusion for this one. Is there, uh, is there, let me see if I can find that if we're still on this. Is there any interest in, in not moving ahead with this? Anybody have any concern about that? Seeing none, then I would entertain a motion. Move to approve um, Alexa Anderson uh, to participate in the Concord Public School deliberation without voting authorization. Second. Oh, would the clerk please call the roll? Okay. Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo, aye. I note that it passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is the annual town meeting update. Madam Moderator. Greetings all. Uh, Mike mentioned uh, during discussion of Ag Day that um, we are rethinking September 12th as the day for annual town meeting. Um, and that is because that is a Saturday and we were planning a Saturday morning and it was brought to our attention by a Concord citizen that that would have, that scheduling would have a um, uh, very unfair disenfranchising impact uh, on our Jewish community in town. Um, uh, we um, thought further about that and we consulted uh, Rabbi Darby uh, at Karam Shalom here in Concord, and we learned that in fact it is an important day of worship, morning of worship for our Concord congregation. There will be a bat mitzvah that morning, and it's also an important Shabbat because it is the last one of the Jewish calendar before Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, which happens the following uh, the following week. So. Um, uh, and, and Rabbi Darby certainly uh, shared the concerns that had been raised to us by a different uh, Concord citizen about what the unwelcoming uh, impact would be and uh, what the disenfranchisement would be for uh, observant Jews if we were to schedule our meeting on that day. So um, uh, we, we are... Um, uh, the, the, um, the scheduling is profoundly difficult with all of the things that we are trying uh, to juggle. It is uh, clearly very important that we respect all segments of our community and be as inclusive as we can for this uh, town meeting, making it as safe as possible for people and 
uh, as uh, much like our usual town meeting as we possibly can, given the special circumstances of the COVID um, threat uh, that we're going to have to make adjustments for. Uh, we really wanted to try and do this during the daylight hours, which uh, tends to suggest a weekend day. Uh, we wouldn't, if the other weekend day is Sunday, we wouldn't want to impact on uh, worship uh, obligations and desires of people who worship on Sunday mornings. So that would mean we should start uh, later in the day on Sunday, um, that time of year. Uh, September 13th, this would be, it may be pretty hot uh, at noon or not. Um, we could start at 11 a.m. at noon at 1 p.m. Uh, and that would still leave us plenty of hours of daylight uh, within which to conclude the entire meeting, we hope, on a single day. Um, we would need a rain date, and our options for planning a rain date would be the following Sunday. Um, that creates a real logistical uh, nightmare for town staff who would have position shares and have to unposition shares, as well as a lot more disruption to uh, the sports organizations and high school that use the Doug White fields. It seems that we're probably better advised to have as a rain date the following Monday, which would be the 14th uh, on uh, at starting at five o'clock. That would still give us a couple of hours of daylight. Uh, I recognize that does put us into the mosquito hour, which is unfortunate, uh, but presumably there's fewer mosquitoes on artificial turf than there would be on an ordinary field. And we would certainly encourage people to bring uh, insect repellent and we would have some available for folks who had forgotten uh, or were unable to bring their own. Um, I understand that there are some real complexities in some, some have suggested, well, couldn't we spray around the field uh, if we, where uh, in any event, couldn't we spray around the field to keep mosquitoes down uh, during the town meeting? But uh, there are some pretty strict regulations about spraying for mosquitoes on uh, school property uh, that require a special uh, exemption, which is not easy to get. You can only get it if you're in the grips of a triple E threat. Um, and hopefully we won't be in September, which means there will be no spraying. So uh, options will be for people to wear long sleeves and bring insecticide. So none of these solutions is perfect, uh, but I think this is probably the best we can do, but I really would like the input of the select board uh, on this. Uh, if we're not going to do September 12th, should we instead do Sunday plan annual town meeting for Sunday, September 13th. If so, should we start it at 1 p.m. or should we start it a little earlier? Uh, and should our rain date be 5 p.m. on uh, Monday the 14th? So those are the scheduling questions for you all. Okay. And who has input for the town moderator? Well, I think that's a, a good solution. There are some risks associated with it, but I don't think we should start it any earlier than one o'clock. Uh, folks in the morning will want to uh, attend to their religious uh, congregations and uh, people probably would want to get something to eat. So I think uh, one o'clock and we just have to hope we don't get you know, some scorcher. Um, and I, you, I, we can't wait a week for the rain date. I mean, that, that I think just creates, as you said, a logistical nightmare. So, five o'clock, four thirty. I don't, you know, I don't know if a half hour, one way or the other, is going to make a big deal of difference. It probably gets dark around seven thirty that 
that time of the year. Well, aren't there big lights on the field too? There are lights on the field. So it's certainly possible at dusk to put those lights on. Yeah. Uh, it, um, one, one complexity is that not everyone will be able to park up at the Doug White uh, Fields parking lot. And in fact, we'll probably need to use the limited parking that's available up there for accessible parking. And that means that there's a pretty good walk back down the a windy path um, to get back to the CCHS parking lot from the Doug White Fields, uh, or even further down to the, um, at least on the, um, uh, the Walden Street side of the building. The, uh, the upper parking lot is not that far, but the Walden Street side is a little further and the BD Center is, is further still. Uh, I don't actually know whether that path uh, is lit. Um, Stephen, do you happen to know the answer to that question? There are, uh, the parking lot is lit and I believe the building has outdoor lighting mounted on it that lights all the kind of, you know, the internal circulation throughout campus. Yes. I don't, I don't know if I've ever even been up there at night yet, but I do know that I have observed parking lot lights and usually by code, you're required to have driveways and things like that right. for security. Um, so it's probably Sorry. Uh, Go ahead, I was going to say we could add lights. I mean, that's, that seems something, if we're if the point is to try and um, make use of of evening hours and and finish town meeting, we could plan for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I bet I which one of the things I uh, Carmen um, is we uh, might want to check with the police department to see about developing a kind of traffic pattern because um, right. we might want to leave one of the roads that go from the lower parking to the upper parking, you know, and have it be closed to vehicular traffic so folks can walk on a a broad a broad path and and so I don't know anything about traffic management, but uh, perhaps we should talk to the chief and well we'll have to do some site planning for that, Mike. I mean the big thing is the parking for people who are handicapped or have just limited mobility will be up at the top and so you can't completely block that off, but you may just have one way in. I was just thinking just one road in traffic only and right. then out traffic only. And I don't know if that's feasible. There was also some parking right in front of the school, not in the upper lot that could be uh, restricted for uh, disability parking as well. So, uh, Terry. Yeah, uh, this all sounds like a pretty good plan. There's not a lot of options left, so it sounds like the best we can do. The only thing, have you uh, considered maybe on this Monday, maybe starting at 4 o'clock or 4.30? Um, I know you're trying to be considerate of people who are working, but if they're commuting, they're not going to be here at 5 anyway. So just a thought. Um. That, that's a great thought. There's two issues. Uh, one is working people. The other is what kind of impact we have on uh, traffic and movement at CCHS. Yeah. Uh, so I have no idea what kind of schedule they're going to be on, whether they're going to have two shifts and what time the buses are leaving on the second shift. And we clearly can't have town meeting arriving when the school buses are trying to leave. So, uh, so um, uh, I think before we set the rain date, um, maybe we'll set the rain date with a date and not with a time just yet. And um, I will coordinate with the superintendent to make sure, uh, I'm not even sure they know yet exactly what they're doing. Uh, but uh, once we figure that out, then uh, we certainly could make it earlier. Um, uh, most folks or many folks are still working at home, I think, and perhaps will be in September also. Mm -hmm. Matt, did I see your hand? Yeah, I just wanted to, us to keep in mind that uh, sunset's going to be right around 7 o'clock on September 13th. So 
uh, it, depending on the orientation, uh, you know, and the time that the meeting starts, it could really uh, be a factor in people being able to see or having the sun in their eyes or, or whatever. So if it started at seven o'clock, the you know, sun would be set. Um, but before then, uh, it, it could have an influence. And in, I guess the Doug White fields, you know, they go east to west. So you might set up facing south. You might, you know, I don't know. Just some things to keep in mind, depending on the time that you set. It's a good thought, Matt. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments for the moderator? Susan. I have a question, but it's not about um, the time. It's about um, typically there are a lot of pieces of business that happen at the beginning of the first night of town meeting um, and the actual business of town meeting um, is delayed a little bit past the official opening time. And I wondered what the thinking was on those um, announcements and recognitions and things that typically happen. Uh, well, thank you for bringing that up, Susan. My thinking on that is that uh, we need still as a community to acknowledge uh, those we have lost, those who have served us uh, ably and um, uh, and with heart, uh, who will be leaving their positions, uh, and those also who have been essential workers, first responders, medical workers, um, continuing to work at the grocery store for us. But I think we can acknowledge all of those people and have a moment of silence or a round of applause or both, uh, and then move on. And I think that uh, we will have a book of uh, town meeting materials that we're going to assemble in a single pile. Uh, we still haven't figured out exactly how we're going to do that, whether it's going to be in some kind of a folder or stapled or what. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, a general reference to people to be sure to look in their materials rather than going through the laundry list of here's how it all works. There will be certain explanations that will have to happen uh, when we get to the consent calendar, of course, for example, that, uh, that uh, there is an option to, uh, if a certain number of voters wishes to pull something off of the consent calendar for full deliberation, they may do that and, and so on. So uh, some of those things will still require uh, uh, explanation, but my plan would be to shorten as much as uh, we possibly can any of the introductory things that we usually do before town meeting. I would not, for example, plan to have the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts bring the flags, even though that is a lovely moment of town meeting when the Boy, Boy Scouts and the, I think we'll have the flags there when we start. Uh, so there, there are, uh, a lot of things that we can for this year only, um, dispense with, and we can be a lot more efficient. Uh, I have been planning also to limit remarks from the floor to one minute instead of two this year. And, uh, for any of you who will be making presentations on, Articles, I would plan to make those uh, very uh, tight indeed and um, hold everybody's feet to the fire. We've also been having some other conversations about exactly how the procedure should work there. And uh, I think, uh, Mike, I know I sent it to you. The, there, the, uh, the town of Bedford is having their annual town meeting outdoors on a football field this Saturday. They're having no presentations, period. Um, all of their presentations have been recorded in a joint statement by uh, the um, school committee and the select board. I think maybe the finance committee was involved. It's posted on their website. You can go watch it. And what they are going to do is read the motion, open the floor for debate, on, and, uh, and then vote on every article. They won't have presentations. So it's an interesting idea. Uh, and 
uh, one that could be worth thinking about. Um, one other thing I should add, uh, our planning group for all of these many details that we have to sort out and how to make town meeting work in this very unusual format uh, has discussed a number of possibilities. Uh, one thing that we've discussed is having a second round of hearings uh, by the select board, the planning board, and the finance committee because many of the hearings that have been had were so long ago, people won't remember them. There's also a statutory problem with the planning board's hearing because uh, by statute, they have to have their hearing within six months prior to annual town meeting. We're gonna be past that. So they are gonna have to have another hearing on whatever articles they're presenting. Uh, and there are also some articles that the finance committee hasn't yet heard. So, uh, you, you know, one one thought is to have a round of uh, Zoom hearings on the articles that will be presented at annual town meeting in the ten days or two weeks before annual town meeting, and those would be. Uh, those could be recorded as a, you know, there can be public comment on those as a Zoom webinar, the same as you've been doing all of the uh, public meetings that you've been doing so far. And we can record those and post them for anybody who misses the Zoom hearing and would like to um, watch it later. So uh, that's all still a work in process. Stephen, I saw your hand, but uh, Karen, I think the a couple things. One, I think we could probably, for all the recognitions that you are talking about, could they just be a, a page in the material that's being distributed? Um, yes. You know, because I, okay. you know, I, you know, it just seems, well, it's not, you know, it's good to recognize everybody, but we don't need to do that. Um, I really like the Bedford idea of no presentations, especially if we have if, especially if we have another round of public hearings, which I think is a really good idea because many of the motions have changed or, and gotten tightened up and it would also kill two birds with one stone if we had these public hearings and if we taped all of the presentations and made those presentations available. Um, that would be something we could put up on the town website, not just as a public hearing, but every article we could get, I'm sure Minuteman could cut and paste them and put each article up. Um, that I think would just save us a lot of time. And uh, we haven't had the meeting, as you know, between the finance committee and the select board, but by my count, there's still an awful lot of warrant articles that folks seem to think we need to deal with. Um, so, you know, no presentations with a lot of public information available and, and really being economical with recognitions. Have a nice page thanking everybody. Uh, I, I think that's all that's necessary. We probably still have to have the fire chief come explain what the rules are for stuff like that. And as you mentioned, there's going to be a lot you're going to have to say about how how this is all going to work uh, because essentially you're going to have to explain everything um, to the audience before town meeting how long they've got what you know all of those kinds of things. that's going to take that's going to take a while anyway so i'm all in favor of no presentations another round of public hearings where we tape them and get them organized on the website um, and taking all of our recognitions and remembrances and get them in this publication. Um, anyway, Stephen, I'm sorry, Terry. Stephen, I saw his hand and I kind of- Well, just, him. sorry, just briefly, um, I concur, Mike. I've been talking or seeing email um, quite or summaries of the town meetings on my MMA thread with my peers in local government. and. 
Um, one of the things that I think, and I know the moderator has talked to other moderators and at least, and speaking from one of the information I've seen, one of the, the familiar themes of the threads is how these outdoor town meetings were just really about voting. Um, and so the, many of them didn't include presentations. Many towns have done the more, have scheduled additional public hearings via Zoom, which is, you can do and done. You know, some of them have done pre-recorded presentations so you can actually see the presentation. In fact, you could, we could pre-record the honoring of um, the, 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 you know, the honoring in the moment of silence and, and the, you know, the people that we usually pay tribute to at the beginning of town meeting on a, on a YouTube um, clip as well. I think um, the biggest thing is, you know, trying to shoehorn four days into an afternoon where it could be 90 degrees or snowing is remains, I think, the biggest challenge, I think, is, as the moderator kind of articulated. So what types of things can we what types of things can we be flexible on um, to limit the amount of time that we're, we're out there on the field? Um, communities have had great success in some of these techniques and gotten through their warrants and under two hours. And I know that, you know, speed isn't really the premium goal here for town meeting. It's deliberation and, and, and educated decision-making. But I think most the communities that have done the, the outdoor town meetings have just kind of accepted it isn't this year because of the unfortunate situation we're in. So I, um, I, I like I said, I, I admire all the work the moderator is doing and I know she's seeing a lot of the same stuff, some same things I am. So I, as we nail these things down, I just, for, for my purposes, um, let the board know how um, the information I'm getting. Yes, Carmen. Uh, j just uh, quickly following up on Stephen's comment, uh, uh, it's true that there have been um, uh, incredible streamlining modifications in town meetings that have taken place around us, uh, outdoors and indoors. There are a handful of people who have done their meetings indoors um, in interesting ways with, you know, a handful of people per room and multiple rooms and so forth. But uh, that said... There still have been, in a number of communities, one or two articles that have been um, uh, contentious and where there has been spirited debate and where there has been as thorough a, an airing of points of view and as thorough deliberation as there ever is at town meeting. And so the process has still been successful in that way and still provided people the same kind of deliberation uh, that they wanted for things they really care about. What I think people have tried very hard to do is really make the hard decisions about what they really care about and not spend a lot of time debating the things that don't need it. Yes, I, I, and also Carmen, I, I forgot to mention that, that the follow-up point of by streamlining and not doing presentations, communities have been able to preserve the time on the field, literally, to have those discussions and really address the issues in Q and A. And I was leading to that point, and then I forgot that I was leading to that point. But you're you're 100 right. That is the biggest reason to streamline as many things as we possibly can is to have the time left to deliberate because it just, it, you know, it's not going to we won't, it's not going to be comfortable for people to go more than two and a half or three hours doing this on sitting on a field. And so I think. You're right. I, I buried the lead on that a little bit, but yeah, I mean, it is, there are going to be ones. That's why I think the towns who didn't do presentations found that the ones that people had questions on did get brought up and discussed and clarified. All right. Uh, yes. I, I think we um, all seem to agree on this, that um, the streamlining is the best and preserving the time for the deliberation. Um, I really like the idea of pre-recording the um, as much as we can, um, including the recognitions. And I'm also thinking, Carmen, you had an excellent uh, draft of, um, you know, how you think all the uh, procedures at town meeting will go. Um, things about the consent calendar and how to do an amendment and, uh, you know, all of it. And um, maybe that could also be pre-recorded because I think we need to reach people in a variety of ways. Um, I think, yes, you're going to have to say it again when we get there that day. 
but if it's also been pre-recorded, because there's a lot for people to absorb, and it should be in the packet. So now they have it three times, because there's a lot of new rules, you know, maybe they want to take something off the consent calendar and they don't know how, and we don't want to waste time on them learning the process when they get there and asking questions about the process and challenging the process and all that. If they want to take something off the consent calendar, they should know already how to do it, make that motion, and get on with it. So if we could put it out as many ways as possible, that would be a real plus. Thank you. Are there any other comments or suggestions for the moderator? Okay, well, Carmen, thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure we'll see you again. Thank you all. The next item on our agenda is uh, committee nominations. You're muted, Linda. Uh, nominate Nathaniel Welch of 141 Stowe Street to the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail Advisory Committee for a term to begin August 1, 2020, set to expire April 30th, 2023. Thank you. And the next item is committee appointments. Um, move to appoint Beth Kelly of 39 White Avenue to the White Pond Advisory Committee for a term to expire 30, April 30th, 2023. Jennifer McGonigal of 31 Highland Street to the Economic Vitality Committee for a term to expire April 30th, 2023. Nancy Stone of 70 Beharrell Street to the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail Advisory Committee for a term to begin on the first day of the month following the 2020 annual town meeting to expire on April 30th, 2023. Second. Second. All right. Would the clerk please call the roll? Okay. Uh, Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo? Aye. Thank you. I know it passes unanimously. The next item on the agenda is committee liaison reports. Who would like to begin? Susan? Um, it was a uh, light week the trails committee met for the first time since march and um, did updates on all of the well, trails they uh, they uh oversee and the cemetery committee also met for the first time since march and there uh they had took care of a, a number of uh, business items and then talked somewhat about um their three goals this year mausoleums and they're thinking perhaps three to five, and they're gonna look at the site where they're proposed to be and kind of nail that down. Um, they're also, they have a project to digitize, scan and record all of the cemetery um, documents so they're available, wow. not just uh, on paper. And um, the third was working on repair and replacement of damaged tombstone. The only other, the other thing that happened was they did agree, the friends of the, um, of Sleepy Hollow are going to order um, tree ID signs. They spoke with um, Aaron and decided on a sign that screws into the tree, but it has a spring thing. So it doesn't, you know, the tree doesn't grow around it. And they are going to label 26 species of trees that were have been here for a long time. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, who is next? I Karen, can... thank you. I have a very short report. Also, I was at the HDC by Zoom, and I, I know Jane was there, and I think Linda. The only real item that I was um, involved in was um, the library. Um, I'm the liaison for the uh, Commission on Disabilities. <clears throat> and um, there was a lot of discussion and some confusion about the parking situation again. So one of the things that came out of that is that uh, Jean Goldsberry from the Commission on Disabilities will be talking with HDC Chair um, Peter Nobile, and they might even schedule a joint meeting um, because these two groups haven't really had a dialogue and they don't 
seem to have connected at all. And so finally, I think we're going to get these two groups together, and that'll be really good. Under. Um, I, I did attend that meeting, um, and I think there were some process issues there as well um, in terms of the chair not being fully informed of the terms of the agreement. Mm -hmm. And so there were, that was quite a meeting in, in that sense. Um, I also attended the uh, Concord Housing Authority and they're still um, dealing with how they're gonna proceed with their search. And they also had some disappointing news from um, an architect that they were helping, hoping would help with the design element um, at, on ComAv, and the bid came in much higher than they were anticipating. So they're back to square one on that. Thank you, Jane. Um, well, many have already reported on the HDC meeting. I'll just um, summarize it to say that that the uh, project of note was the. Um, uh, the changes it to the uh, approved plan for the library expansion. And that opened up a number of discussions, one of which was um, the settlement that had been reached between um, the, uh, the uh, friends of the library and or the, the um, planning group and those who had uh, sought an appeal and that that had not been fully uh, that the that the HTC wasn't as aware of that as they would like to have been, and then again looking at the new, um, the changes, and that you know, it'll be continued. This is not finished. It's not finished at this point. We'll see it some more. And obviously the um, uh, Terry's point about the parking accessibility, et cetera, will be you know will be included in those discussions. Um, the NRC meeting was. Uh, relatively uh, routine with the exception of a larger discussion than um, than perhaps um, the school had expected on the Fenn School's application for a, a canoe launch on the river and um, some concerns that abutters have um, as to the limited use of that launch should a dock be actually built and floated. Again, that that'll be continued. It's it, it's going to be discussed further, um, and it's July, and those are the only reports I have. And are you the liaison to HDC? I am. Okay. Well, we, when there's reports, let's have the liaison report for the, for the committee, or save ourselves a little bit of time. I attended only uh, one meeting which was a school committee. I reported their action on the stabilization fund. They also had a budget update and a very positive evaluation of the superintendent. So uh, that's, uh, uh, that's that. And uh, last item on the agenda is public comments. Is there anybody who wishes to speak? Please just sort of unmute yourself and not seeing anybody do that. I will say that we have previously scheduled an executive session to follow this meeting, but uh, uh, that ex executive session was canceled. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Um, Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo, aye. I note that it passes unanimously. Thank you all for attending. Stay well. Mike, can I just ask something before we're offline? Could somebody please send me contact information for Happy? The contact information? I can yeah. send you that, Susan. Okay, great. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. Yep. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.